Hi everyone, Sal Khan here from Khan Academy. Welcome to the Homeroom live stream. We have a very exciting guest today. CEO of AT&T, John Sandke is here. So start putting your questions on Facebook and YouTube, wherever you're watching it, and I will try to get as many of them as possible uh, to John, a lot to talk about. But before we jump into that, I will give my standard announcements, reminder to everyone that we are not-for-profit. So if you can make your way to conacademy.org slash donate, and if you're in a position to do so, uh, please think about making a donation. It really, really makes a difference. I also want to give a special shout out to several organizations that have stepped up really over the years, but especially during COVID when they realized that the world was more dependent on Khan Academy than ever, uh, but also our costs had gone up. Our traffic had increased. We were trying to put more content, support programs, training for teachers and parents. So special thanks to Bank of America, Google.org, at and Fastly, and Novartis for that support. It's really, really been a big deal. But if you're in a position to do so, all of y'all listening, please think about continuing to uh, support uh, because we, we continue to need help in filling our gap. Also want to uh, remind folks that a version of this uh, live stream is available wherever you get your podcast at Homeroom with Sal, the podcast. With that, I'm really excited to introduce our guest, John Stanke, the CEO of a of a small startup called AT and T. <laughs> John, John, uh, thanks, thanks for joining us. Sal, thanks for having me in, and you know what big fans we are of the work you do at Khan Academy at AT and T. So it's a real treat for me to be part of the curriculum today. <laughs> well, no, and I do have to thank y'all. I mean, it is it is a really big deal the work that y'all do. I mean, on 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 a bunch of levels, and we're going to talk a lot about things like internet access and digital divide because obviously we can't do our work and reach the folks who need it most without that existing. But y'all over the years, not just during COVID, have been big supporters of Khan Academy, and that really means a lot. So everyone listening, if you're able to benefit from Khan Academy, it's at and and organizations like it that really allow us uh, to, to do this work. Uh, but, you know, John, maybe a good, a good place to start. You know, you are relatively new in the job at at and It's at and is a storied institution for you know maybe the younger people who didn't know it's not a startup it's a very, very well established um you know what what was kind of your thought process as you've as you've taken the role and as you've taken this you know i would call at t as kind of one of the institutions of america or the world uh how are you viewing that well you know it's interesting you use the analogy startup and i know you kind of did it in jest but the reality is well it's a storied institution that's been around for a very, very long time. You know, just about every line of business that we operate in right now is in a major state of transition and transformation. And so even an established company like at and I think there's so many different industries and so many large established businesses that because of not only COVID, but what's just going on in the economy in general, that are all undergoing some pretty rapid and significant change. And we're no exception to that. And as a result of that, while it's a big company and we have several large lines of businesses, each one of those inside the company is going through its own transition and transformation. And so it's a very exciting time to come into this role. Uh, it's a bit of a humbling time, as you indicated, which so many of things that we do right now in this COVID environment are dependent on the networks and the infrastructure that we provide. And I'm reminded that of that every day, sometimes positive comments coming back from our customers talking about how they're surviving and living their lives and doing the things that they must do because of the services we provide. But also, I sometimes hear about that moment when the service doesn't work on a given day and just how significant an interruption is it to somebody's well-being and their, their daily existence if that happens and puts a lot of pressure on the organization. But I've been really pleased with how overall the business has performed, how our, our employees have stepped up to ensuring services work during this critical time. And I, I couldn't be more happy about the new relevance that I think people have found in our services in this moment. And where, where do you see your focal point? I mean, given what's going on in COVID, uh, you know, you've written a lot about the need for you know, solving the digital divide issue. Obviously, y'all have been key actors in this. Y'all have really been doing great things when it comes to getting communities through this COVID period, especially communities that did not have internet access, making it far more accessible. What are the programs that y'all have done in the short term? And how are you thinking about this long term? How, how do we solve the digital divide issue? 
You know, it's it's interesting because um, in some regards, there's that old analogy of the old house that needs a lot of structural work that sometimes you put a little bit of plaster or spackling over cracks to hide them. And I, and I would say maybe pre-COVID, that might have been the state of internet access in the United States in some regards. Some very robust and capable wireless networks have been built and, and many individuals were getting their access to the internet and frankly, living their life in a pretty okay fashion with wireless as their answer to the problem. And they made a basic utility and value call and said, for what I need to do in my life and the things I need access for, having a smartphone is is adequate. And that's given that I've got to worry about putting food on the table or going to see the doctor next month. It was a luxury to think about having both a wireless connection and a fixed connection. So many people chose not to do that. And as, as a result of COVID, I think what we've seen is, well, that might've worked before, when somebody's at home and is having to live on the internet 24 hours a day, sit in a classroom, watch a teacher, keep their attention on maybe a multi-screen format with a speaker and other content showing up. You know, there's limitations to that three and a half or four inch screen that everybody depends on and carries around in their pocket every day. And there's limitations in the robustness of a wireless network compared to fixed networks. And so we've really seen that this, this dynamic of you know, the 17 million students that don't have access to fixed broadband becomes a, a problem in this environment. And when you think about all the work that you know, companies, organizations, sorry, like yourselves have done in building great curriculum that can be consumed at home, you really need that robust infrastructure. You need the ability to sit with a, a larger screen and have an experience. And so, you know, we're, we're looking at this twofold. One is there's a public policy issue that needs to be dealt with, and we're leaning into that at at and In fact, I'm starting to orient the company and all of the work we're doing around our charitable giving, what we're trying to do in policy advocacy, how we're engaging our employees and their work in communities to start working on the issues that affect those 17 million students and probably 24 million households that really don't have that robust fixed access to the internet. And that's policy shifts that need to occur. In some cases, you know, we've got a lot of subsidy that are part of our tax structure that maybe is not being directed as effectively as it could. In some cases, maybe we need new ways to subsidize service for those who can't afford to pay for it and trying to get that policy structure proper. Um, I would also tell you there's certain things that we need to do to facilitate the ecosystem. We know that just providing discounted access isn't enough. We, we provide $10 a month access for low income households as one of the services we provide at at and We found that wasn't enough because many homes don't have access to the tablet or the laptop computer that they need to really use that access in an effective way. So putting vehicles in place where we started to donate money into entities that help solve that complete ecosystem of what a household needs for distance learning and access to the internet. And, and then, you know, we want this to be done in a sustainable fashion. And we think that uh, you need good, robust infrastructure. And while we're continuing to invest aggressively in the core parts of our business, the core parts of our network, and we'll be making some announcements here shortly about stepping up fiber investment. Um, look, there's parts of the United States that just aren't that dense. And as a result of that, we need to think about policy that supports access into rural areas with adequate broadband to be able to do most of the things that many households take for granted in, in suburban or urban areas and, and starting to try to drive policy adoption in that regard. I'm curious, actually, I want to double click on each of those, but on that last point, just kind of the, the telecom nerd inside of me wants to make sure I understand things. You know, for everyone listening, you can, you know, dig up uh, kind of the ground and put fiber in it, which is a very expensive proposition. Uh, and then that can get real, you know, really good quality access to a lot of folks. But to your point, if you're in some rural place, it could be very cost prohibitive to make sure that every, let's call it farm, has fiber running through it. Uh, but you think that there's ways to do wireless access that could get us close or get have the sufficiently high bandwidth and, and reliability to, uh, to, to meet those folks' needs. 
if you think about it from a public policy perspective, you go back decades and the United States had a policy that it felt like everybody should get access to the telephone network. And that universal access construct was established many years ago with overt policy around subsidy, around how do we make sure that even the farmhouse in a rural area was able to get on the network, but if everybody paid their true cost of that service, there's no way that farmhouse ever would have been connected. The, the cost would have been so prohibitive, nobody would have ever built those you know, small twisted copper pair wires to that home. So they, we averaged pricing across the United States with the deliberate policy approach to ensure that we eventually got you know 98% of US households onto the telephone network. We're at that same moment for the internet. And when we think about solving that problem, if, if that's the case, there's probably going to be some degree of subsidy that comes in, which may mean public money, taxpayer money. And I don't think the answer to that is that we wanna go and overbuild and, and have fiber out to a farmhouse where it might cost 10 times the amount it does in a suburban or rural area. But can we get the benefits of getting on the internet with adequate bandwidth and maybe a lower cost alternative, maybe something that's only two times as expensive as what it might take in an urban or suburban area, but still get most of the benefits of being on the internet. And, and so one of the policy positions we believe is important is a, is a technology agnostic point of view. Get the most effective way to get a, the right amount of bandwidth out to every home. And in some cases, to your point, it might be using the latest uh, technology around wireless services like 5G. But in some cases, the answer may be a different technology, possibly low Earth orbiting satellites and what's coming up with LEO capabilities. And that might be the more effective way to get to some highly rural households. And in some areas, there may be a opportunity as infrastructure is being deployed for power or electricity to also piggyback fiber in there. The point is you wanna do the right thing at the right time in the right house, but not overspend taxpayer money to gold plate things that uh, ultimately don't need to be gold plated. And we're trying to provide some frameworks now as we work with policymakers on understanding where those cutoffs are and how we think about that deployment of infrastructure moving forward. And, and quick technical question, what's a LEO capability? So um, if you think about satellite technology that's been in place mm -hmm. for many you know, decades, typically you put a satellite way up high in orbit and it sits over a particular part of the United States and it's mm -hmm. geostationary and it mm -hmm. follows you know, that particular part of the geography constantly. With Leo, you know, these, these satellites are much smaller. Oh, lower. Uh, they're, I see. They're I much see. less expensive. Um, you put them up, you know, much lower in the atmosphere. They don't last as long, but because they're so much less expensive, you can cover a much mm. broader part of the United States with allowing them to work in a non-geostationary fashion and circle the globe. And this new technology opens up some opportunities in some rural areas that weren't there before. And what you just described is, you know, do it, essentially saying do it's rational. There's multiple ways of getting internet access. It could be, a, you know, fiber, it could be low earth orbiting satellites. It could be, you know, 5G networks. Is there a resistance of this or is it just kind of, we have old laws on the books that tend to be very focused on landlines essentially? Oh, you know, I think anytime you get into a, a policy debate, sometimes um, there are those that are very knowledgeable about a policy and, very well informed. There are others who maybe tend to gravitate more to the soundbite. And the soundbite is, you know, everybody needs fiber. And, I, and it certainly mm. in an ideal world, would it be great if every household in the United States is connected to fiber? Sure, that'd be wonderful. But again, I don't think that's the optimal use of public funds. Um, one of the things that people like to go and reference is they say, well, you know, look, Korea, how can so many homes in Korea be connected to fiber? Well, you know, Korea actually isn't, you know, quite the size of the United States. They don't have, you know, square states sitting in the middle of it with a lot of open territory and pasture land like the United States has. So when you have a vertical society, the ability to get fiber into most households is quite a bit different than when you have a, a more, you know, horizontal society like the United mm -hmm. States. And you have to use different solutions to that. So 
I think those that are informed and, and know the engineering and the economics behind it understand that this needs to be a, a technology agnostic solution, that we need to use all the tools that we have in the toolbox to address this effectively and frankly fast because you know trenching fiber everywhere takes time, whereas some wireless solutions may get a lot of bandwidth out fairly quickly uh, because of the nature of how that infrastructure is deployed. But I think it's just informing folks with the fact base so that everybody can have a fully informed conversation about it. And one thing, you know, you've alluded to it, this kind of notion of public-private partnership. And I think telecom, you know, growing up, that telecom was one thing that I always got confused about. It's like, okay, who's digging who's digging those trenches? Is that the government or is that the AT&Ts of the world? Who is providing the subsidy? Explain how that works. You know, my understanding it is it's private companies like AT&T that are putting the cost behind the investment by putting the infrastructure, but the government provides uh, subsidies, discounts, incentives. H how does that interplay work? It's it's a complicated question and there's a lot of layers to it. I would tell you, if you think about it at its most basic level, the, the policy up to this point in time in the United States, which has largely been a market-based policy for broadband infrastructure deployment has actually worked quite well. Um, if you think about what's happened in coming into the pandemic with these dramatic increases in traffic, you know, people are not sitting around talking about the fact that you and I can't conduct this session. And at the same time, I'm still not able to watch, you know, my Netflix down the hall, uh, that most of that's working pretty well if you live in a urban or suburban, suburban setting in the United States. And so policy has been really good where markets are competitive, driving that level of investment. But there are places in the United States where because of the density characteristics of how people live, that market approach isn't quite enough to incent that investment in broadband. And, and there have been subsidy models coming in to try to incent uh, companies to go get some help from different government funds to offset the additional costs and then go in and build in these territories. And they've been successful to a degree, but they haven't been you know, quite as successful as they need to be. If there's still you know a large number of rural households maybe you know 24 million non-broadband connected i i bet 70 80 percent of those are in rural areas of the united states we clearly need to think about a little bit different subsidy structure and i think this is where as the government starts to deal with things like infrastructure deployment and maybe the early stages of a biden administration getting those incentives right and explicit and setting companies like AT&T or cable companies or other telcos to go in and build that infrastructure, that opportunity is in front of us. We've had great success with some of those programs in the past. Um, another subsidy program that you may be familiar with is E-Rate. E-Rate was targeted at getting all of our schools in the United States connected. It was a deliberate subsidy program that caused for low low cost infrastructure to be deployed into every school and library in the U.S. And it's been tremendously successful. And we, everybody thought, well, you know, check that box. It's great. We've solved the problem in education until all of our students started leaving the schoolhouse and going home to learn. Now the school was connected, but we couldn't get to the endpoints, the students at home. And this is the next stage that we kind of have to deal with. And Give it, you know, there's likely to be multiple rounds of stimulus going forward over the next several months. If, you know, what are the two or three policy levers that you hope happens over the next, well, over the, one you know, is, the next few I, months? I think we have to think about the subsidy and look at how it's used today and have it kind of come together in a more focused approach. So there's, you know, $10, $10 billion over here in rural subsidy. There's two and a half billion over here and what we do for the next version of E-rate in schools. There's what we do in universal service structure that comes in. I think in some regards, stepping back and saying, if our goal is to get everybody on the internet, let's make sure we take some of those programs, aggregate them and focus them. That'd be one. Two, um, look, if you're going to have to go in and do overt subsidy, then we should think about what the right mechanism is to do that. And I, I think in, an appropriations fashion, Congress ought to be realistic about it. Whereas today, 
some of these subsidies are set up on dying infrastructure. For example, the universal service fund that supports voice service for access today is built on top of fixed telephone line service. Well, if fixed telephone line services are doing this and there's fewer and fewer subscribers, what happens to that subsidy pool? It disappears eventually as everybody goes to wireless services for voice. So we need to step back, make sure that those subsidy structures are put on mechanisms that are sustainable and that are fair to the industry in total. Uh, I don't think we should be limiting our thought process around how we attach that tax structure to a particular product or service. The internet has changed so much how people make their money and what services they use. And we think about how the edge providers, the Facebooks, the Googles, the Amazons of the world, who have benefited so much from infrastructure deployment and the capabilities of the internet, maybe we need to think about the base under which we subsidize to come back on a broader set of services as we go forward that are more relevant for the going forward position and not based on you know the decades of old when we think about voice telephone service. So I think, I think that's a dynamic that we probably need to come to grips with. And then look, you know, understanding exactly where the problems are, believe it or not, a country is as effective and capable as the United States. We actually don't have really good data and information around where our problems are on how infrastructure is deployed. You know, AT&T has a point of view on the markets that we serve and the homes that we handle, but nobody really has a good picture of what the United States looks like in total because there are places in the U.S. we don't service, we don't have infrastructure. And so knowing where we need to put that subsidy, have that policy change to drive the right kind of investment and where the market will take care of it is based on really good data. And that data and funding the ability to ensure that we've got a good mapping of what the circumstances are in the United States is another key element, I think, of what happens to inform really good policy moving forward. And what do you what do you think the odds are that it'll happen? Do you think people are people you're talking to are aligned? You know, you would think. I think there's good probability it can happen. Although, you know, I, I'm the last person to prognosticate on something coming out of Washington. It's oftentimes hard to get the calculus of things. But if if you think about it today, it's it's truly a a bipartisan issue as you know many people you've had as guests here will talk about everybody's in favor of education i think everybody understands that it's a it's a key issue to equality it's a key issue to opportunity it shouldn't be a democratic or a republican issue it it should just be it's good for our society as a whole so you you start from that point of view second thing i would say is that the dynamics kind of line up really well um, if you think about red states today, many of those tend to be rural in nature. They have an internet access problem. And if you think about urban dynamics, which tends to be a, you know, more a Democrat stronghold, uh, they have an internet access problem. And so if the two sides can get together and figure out what we do in urban and what we do to deal with rural, then you would think you have a natural coalition of folks that want to solve that problem. Uh, infrastructure has traditionally been a bipartisan issue. So, you know, if there is something that it would seem like there might be an ability to not only get some good policy done, but figure out how we drive spending in the right place to come out of the COVID dynamic, to equalize education, to stimulate the economy, to help telehealth, it feels like there's enough good news there for everybody that they should want to be part of solving this problem. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I, I've and and I, and I do feel like the energy behind this issue. I've never seen more energy. So so f fingers fingers crossed. In, in the remaining time, you know, there's a bunch of questions that have come in, and uh, you know, some of them are just on on your journey. Uh, where you know, Susanna Garcia Dominguez from YouTube is asking, "Hi, Mr. Stanky, please tell us about your journey to become CEO. Who are your heroes?" And, and how do you reboot or re-energize to keep your life in balance during these these trying times? Yeah, how, how did you get to where you are, and how, and how do you how do you handle it? You know, it's a it's a really good question, and I I'm always reticent to answer this question because, you know, I I and I tell my children this: I grew up at a different time in a different United States 
in a different way of learning than what is the norm today. And certainly, probably a different social contract and different set of companies that were relevant in the United States uh, than what you know a, a young aspiring professional might encounter today. And so, you know, when somebody asks me for advice, what I say is don't do it the way I did it because that probably won't work anymore. Um, you know, what I did is I, I ended up spending a lot of time and becoming quite deep in an industry and building expertise in a particular industry. I, I think I had some lessons along the way when I was young that taught me in an early age the value of hard work and, you know, keeping your head down and trying to do things well. And if that happened, then eventually you would be recognized for it. And I was fortunate enough, in some cases, maybe even lucky enough to come along in my career with a couple of uh, individuals that took an interest in my career, that helped me out, that gave me opportunities, that allowed me to stretch and maybe do some things that were beyond what my capabilities on paper might have said, lived up to those expectations and got succeeding and in increasing levels of responsibility as a result of that. Those lessons probably aren't any different for today's environment, but what is different is, you know, I went through the, the traditional degree structure, get an undergraduate degree, have some pedigree in it, get an opportunity to do a job, maybe go get an advanced degree, have some pedigree in it, get an opportunity to do something more significant. Um, I think that's so passe, and it's not that I don't value education, it's quite the opposite. What I value is a lifelong discipline to learning. And the reality is, I think the successful generations moving forward are going to be individuals who are very disciplined and thinking about in every day as they wake up, in every month, in every quarter, in every year, what are their objectives for their own personal learning? And how are they going to build a curriculum on a variety of tools that are available to them to ensure that they're dedicating their time and energy to do that? And they have to realize that as this, this economy and as our environment has become more global, the internet has done that. You're competing with people all over the globe who every day get up and have access to some of the most remarkable sets of information they've ever had. And if they're more motivated to get it, digest it, and learn it than you are, they're probably going to be more competitive professionally than you are. And so you've got to think about that as you're your own chief learning officer. And you've got to think about all the tools, the capabilities that are available to you, like the Khan Academy and others, how you're going to engage every day to learn more. And if you do that, I think you'll get more opportunity, you'll get increasing levels of responsibility, and you'll keep your skills current as things are moving and changing. And that, I think, has been an is, is going to be an incredibly important part of people's success moving forward. Balance, uh, boy, um, you know, I, I always talk about it internally is you have four dynamics in your life. It's like a box, and you want that box to be a perfect square. And the reality is, very few of us are ever really good at making that box a perfect square. It's your, it's your personal relationships and those people that are important to you, family, close friends. That's one side of it. It's your personal, professional commitment. What you do at work and what satisfaction you get out of that is one element of that box. The third element of it is why do you get up in the morning and what is your reason for being? It might be a set of religious beliefs, but you better be getting up every day and thinking about the fact that there's some greater entity you're serving, either your coworkers, your fellow man, or somebody uh, you know that's more important than you that drives you. And the, the final and the fourth area of that box is really your physical well-being. How healthy are you? How well you take care of this, this vehicle that you have to get through life in? You know, everybody would rather probably drive a Porsche than ride a scooter because the Porsche performs better and your body needs to be a Porsche, not a scooter. And so your job is to think about your life every day across those four dimensions. And when one side of that square is out of balance, work to get it into balance or try to keep it in balance. And I have to use a lot of discipline. It's self-evaluation across those four dynamics. 
It's about setting limits, limits to how my professional life creeps into my personal life, how much time I reserve in a given day to ensure that my body still functions. What am I doing for my own mental renewal? You have to be very disciplined around thinking about those things and not being shy about building the coping mechanisms and specifics to ensure that you're spending time in all four of those areas. Well, John, I, I could talk to you for a few more hours about actually each of these topics, uh, yeah. but uh, you, you need to help keep the nation's uh, telecom infrastructure going so that we can help the, the nation keep learning. Uh, thank you so much for this incredible conversation and thank you again for all of your support over the years. Well, Sal, thank you for everything you do at the Khan Academy. I'm more than happy to be affiliated and proud I could spend some time with you this afternoon. Thanks. Thank you so much, John. Well, everyone, thank you for joining. Hopefully you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. Um, I find John to be an inspirational figure and I have light in my eyes now. The sun has moved. Um, <laughs> I, I really, you know, want, I, I, I hopefully we can get him on in the future again to talk about some of the, the life work balance stuff, which is, I think, you know, something that we're all trying to, to struggle with these days. Uh, but anyway, thanks for joining. A lot of important issues there. Uh, our next uh, live stream will be on Thursday where we have a surprise guest. We're going to actually announce and meet the winner of the Breakthrough Junior Challenge, which is this incredible uh, challenge where students from around the world submit these uh, videos explaining new concepts in math and science. And the winner gets hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of prizes and scholarships. So it'll be a pretty fun conversation, I predict. I will see you then. <laughs>